Coming to you from the city that brings you Late Show with David Letterman and Good Morning America. From our new studio in New York City, it's the return of Ventriloquism Weekly. What's up, what's up, what's up? This is Matt Bailey here, and I am thrilled to be back at the microphone bringing this show to all you ventriloquists once again. I'm settled in at college and ready to resume a full production schedule from my dorm room. So if you ever hear the door or some rustling around, that's my roommate getting ready for class or work or whatever. I'm sure just because of the nature of it, he'll be making a few quick guest appearances over the next few months. He's a really cool guy. And, uh... Quick note, I hope you like the new theme song. That is Patrick and Eugene's All Together Now, just a bit of it. It's kind of funny, kind of cool, and I really like it, and I hope you guys do too. Anyway, on with the show. As promised, we have another spectacular guest with us this week, and perhaps fitting for our first show from New York City, Jay Johnson is the only ventriloquist to have ever won a Tony Award. Think about that. Four words. Tony Award winning ventriloquist. In fact, that is not the only only attributed to Mr. Johnson. He is the only real ventriloquist, to my knowledge, uh, to have ever appeared on a sitcom for any length of time. Everything today is all, let me hire the actor, put a puppet in their hand, and then they go into the studio and dub it. Obviously, he did the, the puppetry and the ventriloquism live on set. And he also writes a daily blog, The World is a Stage, which I will tell you how to find after our interview. And now, celebrating the as-of-yet unknown, but very soon promised, release of his Tony Award winning, The Two and Only, we speak now with Jay Johnson. Mr. Jay Johnson, welcome to the program. Thank you for being with us. Nice to be here, Matt. Well, thank you. I'm going to just turn up the microphone just a bit so that... Okay, great. Well, I always like to begin at the beginning with my guests, and one thing I want to ask you is, how'd you get started in Vent? Well, you know, I, I wrote a whole Broadway show trying to figure that out, and um, <laughs> it, it, it's never been quite clear to me. You know, every, every artist occasionally says, well, I saw Rembrandt, and I decided I would, I would paint, but I really... Um, I think it's a combination of uh, growing up in a small town, being a middle child, being dyslexic, uh, enjoying uh, performing, and all that stuff. I don't. I, I came to um, respect a lot of my uh, mentors later when I understood what I was doing. But I was really messing around with voices when I was uh, five and six, and really didn't know what I was doing. So, um, so it's a it's a long winded answer to a question. I I think I was just born a ventriloquist, man. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it definitely does it does seem to be a calling, and you know I consider you, and I know many in our community do, uh, one of the best ventriloquial writers. Uh, I mean, you won a Tony for that, and I don't want to get ahead in the chronological order here. But <laughs> what is the secret to writing good material? Well. Um, I think everybody has their own way to get to, to their writing and, and find their voice. Finding uh, the voice, which is a very um, nebulous kind of uh, theoretical way to say your style and, and the way you present your, your not only written word, but your spoken word. Uh, finding your voice is really important so that you're comfortable with it. It, it matches who you are and what you are. But, you know, writing, like anything else, is a matter of practice, just like ventriloquism and everything. So... Uh, I write. Um, I write a blog. Try to write a blog every day. And if I'm not writing the blog, I'm journaling. I'm uh, writing letters. I'm writing emails. And you just get better at putting your words together. And um, the other thing about any writer, particularly comedy writer, is just be observant to what's going around you because everything is a story. And a, a comedian really is looking at the life and twisting it in a way that uh, we see our our faults and our foibles and our and our uh, idiosyncrasies in a real unique way that he can he can do so. Um, good writers write, and good dancers dance, and good ventriloquists uh, keep ventriloquating. So it's a matter of what you do. Yes. So let's talk about that Broadway show, and we'll we'll go back to soap. I, I've I don't like to do things in order. Let's talk about that Broadway show. What started it, and how'd you get to Broadway? A ventriloquism show on Broadway. 
Yeah, yeah. Sort of like Edgar Bergen on the radio. It somehow uh, <laughs> is an oxymoron. Uh, I have always wanted to. Uh, I, I guess my 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 favorite media, if if theater is a media, I guess it is uh, a way of expression. Um, my my favorite place to perform has always been on a stage, uh, little stage, big stage, doesn't matter. As opposed to a club or a banquet hall or a, a you know any sort of other place that we all have to perform, but a stage is just meant to perform on. It's like being in, in church, you know. That's where you go to worship. That's where you go to see a show. So all my life, I was trying to find more and more ways to get on stage, and in the back of my mind, always wanted to combine what theater can offer with what I could offer and paint a picture with those colors, you know, and you, you get to paint with different Crayolas when you take a stage. So that's a... a to say that I'd always wanted to do a, a stage show, and finally, um, after just saying that so many times and telling people that so many times, my friends uh, Paul Kreppel and Murphy Cross um, said, "Why don't you do a Why don't you do a one man show?" And I said, "Yeah, I've always wanted to do that, and I, I don't know how to, you know, mount it. I, I really don't think I can perform it. I can write it. I after that." So they just kind of called my bluff. They really said, "Okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna help you, and we're gonna do this." And um, I believe we talked about it conceptually about what it would be and how it would work, and uh, maybe six eight months. And finally, Murphy Cross, who's who's uh, the beautiful blonde of the of the trio here, she said, "What is it going to take to put this show on its feet?" and I said, well, it'll probably mean that somebody will call me and say, we have a theater in two weeks, and you better be ready. <laughs> and then about an hour later, she called me back, and she said, we have a theater in four weeks, and you better be ready. So they had booked the um, White Fire Theater, which is a, I think it's a non-equity, uh, it's an equity waiver theater, 99 seats here in town. And that was it. I had a deadline. I went away on a cruise, so I was isolated for about a week and a half, and um really just sat in my cabin and put all the things together we had talked about and compared all the notes, and pretty soon I found a, a structure that I could hang on to. And uh, That started the journey. And then, like everything else, you find investors and um, you, you move on and on and on. But um, uh, I really thought we were just going to play off-Broadway for a very long time, and then I would get to tour the show around. But we got such great reviews off-Broadway that... Um, one of the producers said we need to take this all the way downtown. So, wow. so we did. That's great. And how have you found through that journey that ventriloquism and theater relate to one another? Well, uh, any performing and theater relate together, obviously, because mm -hmm. uh, that's what that's what, as I said, what theaters are for. So you you come there to watch a performance, um, as opposed to a nightclub, uh, and maybe. That's the comparison, I guess, a nightclub and a theater. Mm -hmm. A nightclub, you have so many distractions. You have waiters and you have waitresses. If they serve food, you've got eating, you've got drinking, you've got people talking, you've got people getting having a little more to drink than they should and, and talking loud or speaking loud. A theater, you don't normally have that sort of stuff. So the focus on, on a theater is, is extremely, um, uh, you know, focused. <laughs> focus <laughs> is focused. But... Um, that allows you to do a lot more things than you can in a, in a situation where you have to kind of ride herd on this animal called an audience. You really have to take a nightclub audience by the horns and really just ride it. But a theater audience, you can play, you can express. They will listen. They're not expecting a, a joke every uh, 30 seconds like at the club. So ventriloquism is made for that kind of thing because it's combination comedy, illusion, uh, acting, performance, and a lot of those things take uh, somebody observing a little more uh, uh, consciously than they would in a in an alcohol infused environment. Yeah, yeah, you know you you know you can go on more of a of a journey as you said with an audience in a theater as opposed to a nightclub. So I read your blog yesterday. I read it every day. It, it's hysterical. Yeah, I mean some of them are, and the, some sometimes of, more than others. Right, right. but sure. some of the last ones have been. Uh, so amusing, and this one about them getting up 
uh, I'm, I, I want him to go read it, so I'm not going to ask you to tell it, but them getting up, and you think it was a max, mass exodus because of ventriloquism, but yeah. it turned out to be something else entirely. And I plugged your blog at the beginning at our at the beginning of this, so they know where to go. And um, the uh, so go and read it. But that said, any tips for those that are starting out and starting to do the nightclub? And I'm actually asking a little more for myself. <laughs> I'll admit because I'm going into New York and I'm going to be doing that. And I'm sure there are many others who want to do it. So any tips for those doing the nightclubs? Well, I, I think. The one thing when you walk onto a nightclub stage, it, it, I'm all about focus. I'm, it, when I do a corporate event, I want to make sure that uh, the stage is placed where it should be in a banquet uh, hall and it's uh, focused with the right lights. It's got the attention of the room because there's so many distractions. Uh, and what you want to do is try to minimize the distractions first, but also realize that uh, it's a very organic kind of uh, audience. They are they are there for a different reason than why they come to the theater. So uh, read your audience is what I'm trying to say. Is you just your timing has to be a little quicker. You have to be a little bit more aware that people are likely to yell out when they're not thinking, and you just have to be. I, I guess I would compare it. I'm trying to think of a great metaphor. I'm, uh, either walking down. The theater might be like walking down a park, you know, having a great time. And then nightclub is more like walking down a very dark alley, wondering <laughs> what's around the corner. You know, you've got to be a little more aware, I think. Yeah, that's it's certainly... Yeah, that sounds... It's interesting, an interesting analogy. Uh, the nightclub to the theater, and you talk about focus. Uh, we get a lot of questions here. One of the ones I wanted to ask you, you talked about writing and practicing writing. How do you go about practicing ventriloquism, not on stage, doing a rehearsal process? Well, it, w it will depend on whether I am just uh, free-forming some stuff that, that I really don't know where I'm going with. There's nothing particular written, but I have an idea that might go somewhere. And that rehearsal might take the form of me uh, and Bob uh, Darwin, one of the characters that I, I think would be appropriate for this idea, just kind of sitting down like we are now, kind of talking and uh Two, I, I know you've had the experience of two comics sitting in a room, and pretty soon they're hysterically funny because one feeds off the other. And yeah. in some strange universe, that's what happens for me and my characters. We kind of go back and forth and just kind of talk about it. Something may come out of that. So that's one way of rehearsal. Then if you've got a script, you really have to rehearse those words, and um, sometimes the words might be a problem. You might have to do a little, um, you know, practice your scales of, of getting that word the way you want it, that expression. So uh, mainly it's just do it, you know, whichever way you do it. You really have to uh, uh, make the time, uh, practice, make that a goal, set a time, do it, and um, and hopefully enjoy it because there's a lot of rehearsal compared to performance. Yeah, there certainly is. And you, you sit there and you go, oh, boy. And then you, you get on stage and you're like, that rehearsal paid off. Good to do. Yeah. It. Oh, yeah. I I always felt like it was at least ten hours per minute on stage. I I thought it was a, it was a good thing. I, I talked to a Chinese. I believe it's called Sumi uh, Sumi painters. They're the ones that do the ink, and their the whole art form is minimalist um, performance. They will create a rice bowl in three strokes of their of their brush, or a bamboo in four strokes, and they pride themselves on the least number of strokes it takes to make this beautiful picture. So if you ask one of those people how long does it take you to create that picture, he will tell you 10,000 strokes. Although he might have used four, he didn't feel like he was anywhere until he did 10,000 strokes. Then he was able to do it in four. And that's, that's practice, that's performance. You do all these hours and hours so you can make it look effortless, quick, and, and um, beautiful. Yeah, that's, you know, and... That's the great thing about our art is, you know, just like that artist, you're create, you're putting the work behind what you want to do. And that's, you know, that's what you were talking about working with Darwin or sitting down. You take the character and you mold it as the artist to the individual character. And so, Absolutely. you know, that's Absolutely. wonderful. That's, that is the way. And, um, you know, that's, it, it's not unique to ventriloquism. It's, it's any art form, any. Yeah. Uh, craft that becomes an art uh, it's all true of that you can't 
you can't play great piano without doing a lot of scales and uh, and you know making some wrong notes when nobody's hearing. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So the whole idea of ventriloquism is eventually that you want to convince an audience that there are more than just one personality on stage. Uh, I was about to say life forms, and that, that's kind of misleading, but you want to see two distinct people on stage. You don't get there without a lot of comfort doing that. So uh, if you're always concentrating on, on a movement of a puppet, then your attention's going to go there. And the audience may not understand what's happening, but they know there's a disconnect between... Because they know what it looks like when two people are on stage, one's talking and one's listening. The one listening is not thinking, wow, uh, you know, that trigger is a little uh, stiff, or man, those eyes are not moving the way they should, or <laughs> i got a little hang-up there. Uh, and all those little mental distractions um, are, are communications to the audience that, that something is happening other than what I'm seeing. So a lot of time to get comfortable so that you can do all of that effortless. And that's what, ultimately, that's what we're after. We want to We want to perform so that it looks like that is so... Easy. He's just talking to this imaginary person. Isn't that easy? And and that's the way it should look. Yes. Now, speaking of the rehearsal process and creating a character, uh, let's talk about Darwin, who you did the uh, late show with David Letterman with. And uh, can you talk about just to focus in on a character? We'll get to Bob in a minute, but um, to focus in on a character and creating it, uh, can you talk about Darwin's creation? What he was created for? If he was for the show? If it was for something else? Uh, just sure, sure. Um, Darwin um, was actually. I, I tell everybody never to do this, and, and Darwin is an, a, an example of exactly what usually doesn't work. But I found that face. It was from a sculptor named Wim Griffith, and he, he was a sculptor mainly. He he did this monkey puppet, and the the face was just I don't know spoke to me. So I, I bought the face from him and um, rebuilt a body around it. And at, at the time, it was just, I, I loved the face. I loved the way it moved. I loved that wraparound puppet style. Mm -hmm. uh, it gave me a lot of freedom. And it was just kind of an exercise in, in puppetry, although I've always loved monkeys. And um, <laughs> so I had this character. Um, and a, a choreographer, a friend of my wife's, and and. Tony also became a good friend of mine, Tony Stevens, who unfortunately is not with us anymore, but mm. Broadway choreographer, and we were at a party with him, and he said, Jay, what are you working on? I said, well, I got this monkey that I'm, I'm working on. And before I could complete the sentence, Tony jumped on a, on a coffee table at this living room and did Send in the Clowns in Monkey. <laughs> and I, I was on the floor. I, I fell apart. I fell apart. I, it was the... It was so clever, it was so unique, it was so monkey, it was so uh, theatrical, that I turned to Tony and I said, well, Tony, we're, we're at, at a situation here where either I'm going to steal that from you, uh, or you're going to let me use that, or I, I'm going to pay you for that edit, because I'm definitely using that for the monkey. And he said, oh, no, no, that's, that's you know, just, that's, that's yours. Great. So I have the puppet now, I have a, I have a song, so I know... I can go somewhere, you know, in an act. Song is a great way to ask Carrie Fader if it's not a great way to end an act. <laughs> um, so I didn't know who he was. And, and I had all this movement, this kind of monkeys are always moving and always looking around and their attention is very short and they're, you know, they're monkeys. But I couldn't find the personality. Finally, I worked with a bass player. Uh, and this bass player was always hearing a beat in his mind. So he was always kind of rocking back and forth. And he would occasionally just explode in laughter. Uh, and he would get, get way down, and, and he loved jazz. And I just kind of look at this, looked at this bass player, and I said, that's, that's a great model for the character. So I kind of took this guy in my mind, and uh, that's where Darwin started. And then, of course, they grow, you know, with their own little quirks after you get to work with a puppet for a while. So he was really created backwards. Normally I say, find a character, create a face, get the act. But this was, I found the face, I looked for an act, and finally got there. But it worked out for Darwin. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. And uh, so now it's time I'm going to... Uh, I know you've been probably asked about this in every typical interview, but, you know, let's put the spin on it about ventriloquism. You know, soap. How, how, how did a ventriloquist get on a sitcom that was incredible. How, how did that happen? 
<clears throat> well, the, the logistics of uh, getting, you know, on a television show are you go down, you audition, you, mm. you uh, get hired, the network approves you, and then you hopefully stay on, and hopefully the show stays on itself. Um, so, it, it, like any part on any sitcom, it, every actor goes through that process. But it, one step back, when Susan Harris wrote Chuck and Bob into um, Soap, so obviously it was written before anybody had uh, me in mind, um, I asked her that very question, how did you come up with Chuck and Bob? She read the, the book, which was uh, a new novel at the time called Magic by William Goldman. Mm. It later made into a film with uh, uh, Anthony uh, Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, but the, the book was so much better than the movie, in my opinion, because Goldman writes in a style that uh, a lot of times, if you know who that character is, the, the ending... Like in uh, Marathon Man, you don't know it's the same guy. Well, the book is written so you didn't know who this character Corky was and kept influencing uh, 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 Fats and influencing Corky. And in the book, you later find out that Fats is a ventriloquist puppet and Corky's been doing all this insanity himself. She thought that was a great, crazy character since Corky had committed some murders in um, magic. She just kind of lifted the description and lifted the uh, kind of history of, of Corky and put it into soap. Um, originally, Chuck and Bob were supposed to be the killers of Peter Campbell, which was the, the, the hook on the last season, I guess. So I was, I was to be the killer. I was supposed to be written off after 10 shows, uh, just as one of the characters that went through soap. And fortunately, they got enough na- mail pull, and the character really found its way into the Campbell household that I, I stayed for the rest of the run of the series for four years so and you know that was we talked at convention i said that was the first major appearance of a you know ventriloquist on a sitcom and some some things are doing that now but they're doing it and it's not ventriloquists and it it upsets me so what i want to ask you is did you ever have to do i know you did it live did you ever have to go back into the studio and do overdubbing for the character. Ever go, have to go into a voice booth? <clears throat> we never, we never did that. Uh, occasionally, um, there are pickups that you do. So if you don't, if you don't get it in the scene uh, as it is, you'll go back and do the scene. But that would be with everybody. If it was just me, it would just be me and Bob. You would redo the scene if you know all the little technical things didn't matter. But. Um, <clears throat> I don't think Jay Sandwich, the director, would have let it go had it not been clear to begin with, with all the actors on stage. I, I don't think he would have um, waited to go back and, and ADR or loop it or whatever they would want to do there because it, it just takes it one step away from the reality. So, we, yeah, we never went back into the studio, which is, which is unlike any film that I've ever done. I, I think every film has had at least an element of going back in the studio and uh, me and Bob kind of matching our dialogue on, on the screen. And so... There, there's, there's, Matt, I just have to tell you an interesting story. I, everything reminds me of a story, as you know, but uh, there was one time we had done this. We had had to go back and uh, loop some stuff. Um, ADR is what they call it, automatic dialogue replacement. You go into a booth, and you've got a screen, so you see the film in black and white because it hasn't been processed yet. And you've got the microphone, the headset, and it's a typical recording studio, and there's four beeps, and on the fourth you do your dialogue, and they see if it matches, and then you do it again until it does. So it was, it was Bob's voice, and I didn't realize we were doing Bob, so I did not have Bob there physically. So we get down to the point where Bob is going to do his uh, ADR. And, and I did it like any ventriloquist would, without, you know, with the technique I've, I've practiced, because it's not going to sound the same if I move my lips. Mm-hmm. So the guy in the control room, uh, I did it once. He said, hold on just a second. I got a problem. Went, okay. So we did it again. He said, you know, I, 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 let's, can we stop just a second? Let me, let me try again. So he adjusted some more things. Tried it again. Finally, the producer was sitting. They, the producer couldn't see me. The, only the engineer could. And they said, what's the, what's the problem? And he said, well, I've got the sound coming in. I don't know where this track is coming from. And, and every time Jay starts to do his stuff, I hear this, this, this voice first and, well, what he was seeing was me not moving my lips, and, and he didn't know where that sound was coming from. He thought, you know, one of the 
uh, 72 channels he's trying to deal with. So when they finally said, you know, he's a ventriloquist, he went, oh, thank God, we're out of there in about 10 minutes. So. <laughs> that, well, hey, that's a... That's the ultimate uh, ultimate compliment to... Um... Yes, it was. It was in a, in a strange kind of, uh, you know, there again, like the people walking out at, at the horn, I immediately thought it was me. I thought, oh my gosh, what am I not doing that they want? You know, how can I please them? And it had nothing to do with that ego. So, so. Wonderful. And, you know, perfect segue back to the, the journey to soap. What, what, uh, what brought you there? Because you mentioned in that article... Uh, and I'm mention- I just keep referring to this article because I know this is going to air like three weeks after it's recorded, but it's the one from yesterday, you know, that the person who booked you on soap came to see you. So you didn't have to go through that typical, uh, or at least the impression from the article was that you didn't have to go through that typical situation of the screen test, walking into the audition. They saw you and said, hey, can you come to a screen test? So can you talk up to that moment, like, what got you there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and you know, uh, today, in today's term, a screen test uh, is still called a screen test. Rarely does it involve uh, actually going on screen and, and doing the makeup like they did in the old days and seeing if you look good in the costume and all those. That was really a test. Network test today is you come in um, reading the part of the character for the casting director, and if, if they think you read really well, that's your test, and the network says, yeah, he's good enough for you to hire. Uh, but there was, um, at the time I got to L.A., I, I, I was at the Horn, and I'd done a lot of the talk shows. I'd done a lot of the television that you could do. Had a real high-powered manager, but there was an ad in the paper that said uh, uh, they were looking for a ventriloquist for a television show. So on a whim, I just kind of went down after everybody said, did you see this? Who could believe this article, this this audition uh, ad? So I went down and auditioned. They asked me to come back, uh, uh, you know, audition for the producers, and uh, probably twice, and then kept going up the chain. Finally, they said, um, uh, good, we're going to, take you to the network for your screen test. So we go to the network then at ABC with all the producers and all the directors. And basically, if, if the network said, no, he's, we don't, that's not the guy we see in the part, then they would start all over. But um, when we got into the room finally, and um, Pam Dixon was the head of casting at the time, uh, we were waiting a very, very long time at, at the cold kind of impersonal offices of ABC. Mm-hmm. And the director was there, Jay Sandwich, and the producers, Thomas Harris, everybody was there. Nobody was getting let into the office. And finally they came out and they said, Pam is stuck in the elevator on the 10th floor. We were on the 15th. <laughs> oh, no. And we don't know when she'll get out. But when she does, I, we assume that she will feel like going on with the test. And so if y'all can just hold here. Well, she finally gets out and uh, everybody goes in the office and I'm, I'm still excluded. Casting person comes out and says, "Wow, she was she's stuck in an elevator. You you really better be funny." And I don't know if that was a joke or a threat. I don't know. <laughs> Finally, when I walked into the room with Pam Dixon, she went, "Oh, Jay, of course." And she had been to the horn, so it wasn't a matter of me reading the part, or she already basically had thought I was good for the part. And um, so I didn't even read the script. I just did a little routine for her. She said, "Do the do the thing that I saw you do with the horn." Da 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 da. And I, so I did a little routine and walked out and. They came out and they said, congratulations. So, um, Part of the journey was very typical, like any other actor. Part of the journey was unlike anything you would ever know from stuck in elevators to nightclubs. So now, as a ventriloquist, what influence did you have on the development? I know uh, that she created the characters and wanted to find you guys to do it. But what uh, what input did you have in the creation of Bob? Uh, nothing in the uh, physical creation of Bob. They uh, they had decided that they had a look they wanted. They found um, Puppet Maker. Originally, the character uh, Bob and Chuck had come after living in Hawaii, so the implication was that Bob was Hawaiian. So we, we were both in Hawaiian shirts for about five out of the first ten shows, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, So he was a little bit ethnic, a little bit curly-haired, you look a little Hawaiian. His, his tone was that way. And um, once we got into the character, what I realized was I saw so many actors come in, play a part for 
uh, three or four notes, and then they would be written out, the, the guest actors coming in. And I realized that the longer they could keep writing things for Chuck and Bob, the longer you would stay. So every year I would go into the producers with a with kind of a bullet point list of a uh, hundred things I could do. You know, Chuck and Bob could go skating. Chuck and Bob could um, be sitting at the breakfast table. They could do this. They could do that. I, I would actually give them the kind of the the nuts and bolts of a of an act, and um, they would never say thank you. They would never say, "Oh, this is perfect, Jay." They would just say, "Oh, this is very nice." And then throughout the the rest of the season, I would see most of those ideas come back in a in a script. So uh, once that idea was in the script, I knew exactly what to do with that because that that would, had been my concept. So it looked like I was a, a smarter actor than I was at the time. <laughs> That's great. Had you done um, anything? In, uh, you know, because a lot of ventriloquists follow the path of doing theater. Are you also training in theater then to head into television? Had you done any acting in the theater not related to ventriloquism? Yeah, so, yeah, in, in high school and college I had done that. And it, it was the, I guess it was, I wouldn't say it was a second love. It was just another love. But mm -hmm. I loved acting. I loved performing. Uh, I loved performing with puppets and doing ventriloquism. I never thought I would ever have a chance to do both. And uh, as it turns out, I got to do soap, which was working with some of the finest actors in Hollywood. And then um, I go to Broadway and have a bunch of actors give me a, a Tony Award. So yeah, that was, that was really, really nice because it really did combine the two passions that, uh, that I liked the best. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's why I asked it is because when we think of you, you know, the ventriloquism community thinks of you, they think, Jay Johnson, oh, ventriloquism and theater blended beautifully. And so, you know, describe that feeling of, wow, I won a Tony. <laughs> you know, what was that like? Well, you know, you always, I guess every actor has uh, the, the speech he's going to get when he wins the Academy Award in his back pocket so that any moment he can pull it out, you know, and it. <laughs> I, I always have no patience with a, an actor who will get on stage and say, oh, I don't know what to say, because, it, you know, from the time you're nominated to the time you do the part, if you don't have this egotistical idea that if you walk on stage, what would you say, then you're not very prepared. But um, uh, we had come back to New York. I was, the show had closed uh, before the Tony Awards. So I came back to L.A. and then uh, heard that... Uh, the Tony nominations were going to come out. And my publicist said, look, I, I'm hearing rumblings, but I don't know. But come back to New York and just be here for those. And I said, well, I, you know, I don't know what I can do. We had planned on um, inducting Bob into the Smithsonian Institute, the original soap Bob. Mm -hmm. um, I, I performed with a couple of three Bobs. And so the first one was going to the Smithsonian. So the publicist worked it out so that that week of induction would take place at Sardi's uh, in New York with the Smithsonian, and it would also be uh, a Tony nomination day. So it was, it was really kind of a thing where I was in town for the Tonys, but it was also could say, oh, no, I didn't come for the Tonys. I just came for this, this thing. Um, and as it worked out, uh, that morning they, they announced uh, my name along with the other nominees. And um, so we went to the Smithsonian Institute uh, kind of induction, uh, uh, kind of riding on a cloud. Mm -hmm. So then you sweat, you know, like any, anything, you, you, you kind of wonder if, uh, if the nomination is not the, the reward. And pretty soon you convince yourself that it is, that no matter what happens, you're nominated. So for, for the rest of your life, I was nominated for a Tony. So I could always say that. Sandy, my wife, was convinced that, uh, that they were going to give it to me or they wouldn't have nominated me. That was just the way it was. Mm -hmm. But they don't tell you. They say, uh, here's your seats. You're in the um, Radio City Music Hall, huge theater, seven rows from the front. And uh, Carol Prop is, uh, is a talent coordinator that I knew. It was doing the show. And she said, look, um, you've got 90 seconds from the time they say your name, if they say your name. So hurry up. Don't forget to thank your wife and, uh, you know, uh, be prepared. So they don't tell you when it's going to happen. They don't tell you what part of the show that's going to be. You just sit there watching like everybody else, and, and when somebody comes on stage and he says, I'm here to announce the award for, you kind of hold your breath and say, okay, it's not me yet. Um, 
Eddie Izzard comes out on stage. I'm a huge Eddie Izzard fan. Sandy and I both turned to each other and they go, we said, oh my God, we are seven rows from Eddie Izzard. This, this must be the coolest time in the entire world. And then he says, I'm here to announce for, uh, uh, the award for uh, Best Special Theatrical Event. And suddenly Sandy and I realized that's my category. So we pulled up really fast, you know, and from that moment on, when I realized that this is the category, everything kind of everything kind of goes into spin. The last thing I remember is um, standing on stage with with all the producers saying thank you to the Broadway community, and they hustle me off. So, wow. um, it, it was just it was just a magical time. I mean, I couldn't think of a better person I would like to get a Tony from than Eddie Izzard. I couldn't think of a better place than the Radio City Music Hall. It was all uh, a wonderful. Um, a wonderful thing. What one thing that night that I, I just thought of? Uh, they take you immediately back to the press room and you talk to everybody and you really don't know what to say. But people ask me questions. Uh, and I passed by uh, Julie White, who who is an actress who won uh, Best Actress for um, uh, Little Dog Laugh that year. Mm. So we passed the hallway. She's got. She's holding a Tony. I'm holding a Tony, and we just kind of giggled to ourselves. We're in in the hallway, <laughs> and I said, "Oh my God!" And she said, "Yeah, isn't this amazing?" I said, "Wow, uh, you've got a Tony. I've got a Tony." She said, "Well, <clears throat> you're, you're Tony." She said, "You you may be special, but I'm the best." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, but no, my award says best special, so I got you, Trump." <laughs> <laughs> uh. That's great. Now, one last thing before we go here. Uh, what do you want to see from this generation of ventriloquists that are going to come in and do things and, you know, the generation that's learning? What do, What's the, the thing that's missing that you want to see from the young generation? Well, that's a great question, Matt, and I, I'm not sure I would ever have a good answer. Uh, I, I just want it to be, um, I, I want to be entertained. I, I want to to laugh if laughing is appropriate, and I want to cry if crying is appropriate. And who knows what what the next generation is going to bring. Uh, I've seen some wonderful uh, advances in uh, electronic puppets and uh, on-screen faces that you can take and mold, and uh, uh, John P.C. has a great application for that. Um, so I don't know what the, what the look is going to be, but I know eventually what a ventriloquist has to do is create two people on stage at the same time. No matter what face that puppet is, it's going to have to have a complete personality and um, and life form to the audience, just like the ventriloquist does. So, I I guess ultimately in any act from now in the future, I want to see not um, not a tennis match, but but a basketball game. Because tennis match, you hit it over, you wait for the other person to hit it back. Basketball, you're always trying for the ball, so there's a lot of people. Everybody's moving around. I want to see a ventriloquist stay alive on stage as much as the puppet uh, and, and never see, oh, the puppet dropped. Oh, that guy, is, is, I see him concentrating on his control. Um, I want to forget that I'm watching uh, a guy do a puppet. That's what I want to do. Wow, that's great. That's a great analogy and a great way to end this. Mr. J. Johnson, Tony Award winner, thank you very much for being on the program today. You bet, Matt, and, and congratulations on, on doing this. I, th I think you're a, a wonderful host, and I hope you can continue to do this, and I will continue to listen. How's that? Thank you. All right, pal. Many thanks to Jay Johnson for being with us this week and making our Big Apple premiere so much fun. We will keep you updated on the video release of The Two and Only, and now here's how to find Jay's blog, uh, The World's a Stage. The World is a Stage, and you can find that at Helen Hayes dot blogspot.com hell and haze dot blogspot.com and that is spelled a little uh it has a little bit of a unique spelling so i'm just going to spell it out here uh, h-e-l-l-a-n-d-h-a-y-e-s dot blogspot.com so go check it out he writes a blog every single day sometimes it's uh, ventriloquism tips sometimes it's stories from his life in show business or an observation he made the night before. It's a really, really fun read. Go check it out. And before we go, uh, just a quick word about programming. We have 10 wonderful episodes now, and unfortunately I have to start taking some down because of bandwidth room on the site, on the hosting site. And I knew this day would come ever since I signed up on Podomatic and saw what I had. Uh, so I looked a few months down the road to this day. 
Um, so please download the first few episodes if you want to keep them. I'm going to keep like all the extended episodes and, and different things up there. Uh, I'm going to be pick and choose. I'm going to try not to pick and choose. Um, like uh, I'm just going to start with that first one with me rambling and just work my way down every week. I'm not doing it this week, so you have a week to do it. Uh, but I'm going to try and find out this week if there's an alternative site that I can upload everything to once I take it down and give you kind of an archive site to go go to. And if I do, obviously you guys will be the first to know. And we are now in New York City at least, at least until December. Uh, well, I don't say at least. We're here till December. We go back home to Pennsylvania for January. And then we come back at the end of the month. So we're in a better spot to do a lot more for a lot longer period of time. Because remember, I started this in July. So send me your things, what you want to do. You know, being in New York City, there's a whole bunch of resources. If you guys know of a ventriloquist here in the city that I could do an in-person interview with or uh, just different things, what you want to hear, I'm also going to try and start some behind-the-scenes stuff. So let me know what you want from us now that we get off the ground here in New York City. This is back and better than ever. I've been looking forward to this day for quite a while. So email anything you want at uh, ventriloquismweekly at gmail.com. And that's it for us this week. And all of our episodes, as you know, are available to download on iTunes. You can also listen and follow us on our hosting site, ventriloquismweekly.podomatic.com. That's kind of the Facebook page, if you will, for Ventriloquism Weekly. So again, we're here in New York. This is so much fun. Let me know what you want to hear from the show. Thank you guys for bearing with me through the break. And here we go. Signing off from New York City for Ventriloquism Weekly, I'm Matt Bailey, reminding all you vents out there to keep talking for two. <laughs>